So welcome in everyone. Welcome to our video today. This is the Soul Journey Project. I'm Andrew. And I'm Tiana. And we want to welcome you guys today as we start a new series on our channel as we feature uh, individuals, families, couples who are doing amazing things, who are pursuing their dream. And this is our first one of 2022. Yes, we are very excited to begin featuring stories that are very unique and special, and we hope that they inspire you to pursue your dreams as well. Exactly. Also, before we get too deep, we want to remind you, check us out at www.souljourneyproject.com mm -hmm. or on Instagram at Soul Journey Project. Mm -hmm. So let's jump in. Yeah. So we are joined today by D'Artagnan and Hong from Sailing Lutris. Mm -hmm. Welcome in, guys. How are you doing today? Great, thanks. How are you guys doing? We're good. We Glad to good. have you. Thanks. I know I'm excited. Absolutely. Are you guys excited? We are, yes. Good, good. excellent. <laughs> excellent. So just as a quick little intro for the folks out there, um, Hong and I are colleagues at the company that we work for. Uh, and over the last year, as I got to know Hong and she shared with me, uh, you know, different things about her background and her story, I was just so inspired by what she shared. And I said, hey, we got to get you on the Soul Journey Project. People have to hear your story. Mm -hmm. So she so graciously accepted our invitation, her and her husband. And uh, we are so thankful to them because we think you're really going to get some, some gems, some golden nuggets mm -hmm. out of our conversation with them today. Yes, let's dive in. So can you all tell us, you know, just tell us about your background, your story, whatever you want the viewers to know today. Sure. I'm Hong and um, I was born in Vietnam. Um, my family and I immigrated to um, Seattle here when I was three. Um, we, my parents, um, uh, really wanted to basically make a new life for us here in, in the States. Um, and um, so we settled here right after the Vietnam War. And I grew up very much so in a traditional Catholic Vietnamese household. Um, English was actually my second language. Um, now it's become my primary language, but um, growing up, it was very much so my secondary language. And um, you know, just kind of uh, learning how to navigate both worlds of the traditional upbringing. And here we are today with D'Artagnan and um, living on a boat. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm D'Artagnan. I, I also grew up very sort of uh, traditional one brother, two parents, uh, East Coast, um, and uh, from. Uh, from a, a, a young age, I knew that I wanted to get myself on boats as often as I could. Um, and so that's kind of what has led us to where we are today, I think. Awesome. So you heard it first here, folks. They live on a boat. <laughs> I don't know how many people you know that live on a boat, but I know two people that live on a boat. <laughs> you too. That's you too. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about your backstory. I mean, you kind of shared a little bit about, you know, how you grew up and where you're from. How did you get from, you know, growing up and just living life to deciding to live on a boat? What was that kind of story? What did that look like? Uh, when I was uh, a teenager, uh, about 15 or so, uh, I was visiting my grandparents in uh, Sandusky, Ohio. And their boat was in a marina uh, there and and uh, right next to their boat, which was a very sort of traditional wooden uh, uh, looking sort of classic looking boat was a was a sleek uh, giant as far as I was concerned, uh, a sailboat that uh, was sharing a dock there that summer. And I, I took one look at that when I was 15 and said, I want that. That that is exactly what I want. Um, and so as I sort of moved through life, I was always thinking about, okay, well, how do I get to be closer to water? How do I get to get more time sailing? Um, so I spent lots of time in my teenage years uh, in, in Sandusky, Ohio, there sailing. 
uh, and then helping friends deliver some boats down the East Coast uh, in the winters when when boats move from the Northeast down to the Bahamas and the Virgin Islands. Um, I did a few trips like that. And then uh, when it was time to sort of pick where I was going to live when I was a real boy, uh, I came to Seattle. So I left Northeastern Pennsylvania with with my SUV packed full of all my goodies and the trailer behind me and drove across country and landed here um, and uh, got about, uh, I don't know, five seconds into boating, um, basically went for one sail with my uncle who lived here and promptly got absorbed in uh, traditional life. Uh, got a job and an apartment and, uh, you know, uh, all that kind of normal stuff and a series of better cars um, <laughs> as far as better goes. Uh, and then uh, met Hong and we started spending some time together and I don't remember exactly what happened. How did we end up with the first boat? Um, well, Swan, your uncle. Yes. So my uncle Swan uh, was moving off of his boat uh, and was having a, a hard time selling it. And so I said, well, I don't really have any money, but you can give me the boat and then I'll pay you as I have money. Um, <laughs> and, and he thought that that was a reasonable idea, mostly because I think he spent a year and a half and, and couldn't find anybody to buy it. It was it was maybe 15 years ago when when boats were hard to sell. Um, yeah, this is in like 2009, 2010, maybe. Uh, even right? earlier, I think. But yeah, yeah in and around there. Like, yeah. yeah, during the um, recession. Mm -hmm. And so boats were very much so not being purchased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that led us to our first boat. Um, mm -hmm. And so we would be, you know, out on the weekends and take our friends out and get out sailing. And uh, little by little, we uh, we came to really enjoy the time we got to spend on the boat and where we were going. Um, that boat was uh, a bit small um, and didn't have some of the creature comforts that uh, most of us are used to. Things like running water or hot water or a freezer. Um, <laughs> heat uh well no it had that good stove um <clears throat> so uh as we were spending more and more time in the boat uh both maze more or less just using it in the summers um because the weather sort of precluded it uh from being used in the winters uh i don't know we just talked about being able to be out more often and and for longer periods of time and, and Hong said, well i can't possibly do that on a boat that doesn't have hot water <laughs> I'm with Completely you. Reasonable. Yeah, right. Yeah. A reasonable request, I would say. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, a flushing toilet and hot water seemed like that. I should be able to do something about that. Um I don't want to seem too high maintenance, but that was my that was my threshold. <laughs> hot water. Well, honestly, if that's your standard being high maintenance, hot water and a flushing toilet, then I'm high maintenance for sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, it turns out that it's really quite nice. I think I could have survived on that boat. Uh, but it clearly would have been alone. Um, so <laughs> not, not your marriage. <laughs> not, not, yeah, no, yeah. Um, so uh, this is better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, about six years ago, um, we were not looking to to get a bigger boat at the time. We had been talking about well, it would be neat to sort of uh, fold up the the rat race, get out, get off the treadmill, um, retire earlier than either of our parents did uh, and get out and be able to spend time together. Um, yeah. Post post children being in the house. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, lots of empty nesters, I think, find themselves uh, not knowing what to do with themselves anymore <laughs> when they're alone. Uh, so we had actually started planning for that when the when the our boys were still, well, what were they 12 and 17, give or take? We're like, well, you know what, we're gonna you guys are gonna be on your own for a little bit and we're going to go be together for a while because mm -hmm. that sounds good and we tried um to uh, uh have them experience kind of uh, the joy that we have being on the boat but that did not work at all 
<laughs> they are very much so um, they just didn't want anything to do with it. And so we wanted to um, respect their boundaries. And um, we said, OK, we'll put off this plan because if it was up to us, we would have sw swapped them up and put them on the boat and we would have taken off. <laughs> but um, but they were very much so. Um, wanting to to continue building the community that they have built here and and so we decided okay what what comes next once once they're off to college and uh, we have a little bit more time on our hands um what does that look like while well, we're still fairly healthy um and able body um to be in such a very uh, physical um uh hobby i guess or lifestyle <laughs> yeah i guess because i mean it's just the two of you on the boat so you have to do everything including repairs and maintenance and pulling up the sails and pulling down the sails and pulling up the anchor and all that and i'm sure some of this is probably mechanical nowadays but um if the While mechanical part broke yeah. down you'd have to be out there pulling her in right yeah yeah without a doubt well, you'd yeah. be surprised as to how much physicality it takes just to stay upright. So, <laughs> oh, sure, just the balance it takes while the yes. waves are, are rolling. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there's a couple of things you guys said, um, and I know we have we've already kind of planned out our, our conversation a little bit ahead of time. But um, one thing you said was retire early or earlier than your parents did. And we know about the so-called FIRE movement, um, financially independent, retire early. Are you all kind of following the FIRE path or not really? It's just, you just kind of not, want yeah, to retire not, early to... Yeah, I would say not structurally um, as kind of black and white as the almost the FIRE movement is, but I would say, and I would say um, it's more of a sabbatical for us um, than an actual retirement. Um, I think one of our biggest fears is looking back when we're in our 70s and regretting not having done um what we could do while we were still able to do it um so i think that for us um is what's really driving this is you know we're again knock on wood um fairly healthy and still able um to uh, have the physical stamina it takes to you know be at sea for several uh, weeks at a time um and also just um the kind of the mental state um or the having the um agility i think as we get older um i don't know if <laughs> i'll necessarily have that flexibility of being okay with you know being off grid for uh several weeks at a time if we need to be sure yeah, so it sounds like you know so when many people think about pursuing their dream and doing something drastic in the way that you all did fear tends to hold people back mm -hmm. but it sounds like from what you just said fear was actually the motivator <laughs> in a sense you know because yeah. you want to have those regrets is that what you would say um, well, at least for me, and you know, I'm actually deathly afraid of the water. Uh, <laughs> as funny as that sounds, my only experience with boats growing up is that my parents fled on a rickety fishing boat, um, you know, in in the South China Sea, um, and escaping communism. So for me, wow. that comes with an entire traumatic background. And my dad likes to tell the story of how when we were rescued by Japanese, a big Japanese fishing boat, everybody was, you know, really hurrying to get onto this fishing boat. And they almost lost me at sea because they looked back and I was still on the on the smaller boat. Um, and so, yeah, so there's there's this whole traumatic story behind that. And I never thought growing up um, that I would ever live on a boat. <laughs> or much you know that I, I would even say i would never have thought traveling by boat was an option mm -hmm. um 
but as you know, we've we've uh, as our relationship has grown, and D'Artagnan's been kind of planting these seeds early on in our relationship. <laughs> um, little did I know it kind of got us here. Um, so yeah, so that's my background story with boats. And mine's the exact opposite. Uh, I have <laughs> a, a long, long, long family history of, of boaters. Uh, and I'm more a duck than I am a person. I feel better in the water than I do on land. Um, I don't get seasick. I don't get nauseous. I can swim for days on end. Um, and, and the sailing part has been, you know, taught to me in lessons in school and, and, everything else since I was, uh, I bought my first boat before I bought my first car. Um, you know, so <clears throat> we've spent, uh, I've spent a lot of time on boats and thinking about boats uh, and, and wanted to get to a place that I could, in my mind, it was to retire onto a boat. Like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to put in my, however many years you're supposed to put in of your 40 hours. Um, although I got off that train a long time ago. Um, <laughs> And, and then we'll, you know, we'll get the kids all set up and then we'll head out and, you know, into the sunset until we can't climb up and down the ladder anymore. Um, and then uh, my, uh, I had a dear uncle who, who passed away rather suddenly and it was right as he retired and right as he sort of, he took a little bit of time to formulate what his plan was going to be. He was going to get an Airstream and, mm -hmm. and trailer around the country and, and went and ordered the Airstream and paid for it and then uh, had a stroke and dropped dead. And so I was like, well, let's not do that. <laughs> let's yeah. not wait that long. Yeah. Um, let's make sure we get, get our time to do our thing uh, before we have that happen to mm -hmm. us. And at that time, that was about six months after he had officially retired. Um, but at that time, my, my dad had also had uh, triple bypass surgery a uh, heart surgery and so there were a lot of these um almost these signs for us um indicating that life is way too short and we have got to consider um what is it that we really want to leave this world with and for us it was really solidifying this idea that um, we can see some amazing places on this planet um, by boats because one 70% of the of the of earth is water and <laughs> and so um it's not as you know accessible uh, for most people unless you have a boat so um and that's uh, i think that's uh what drives me um you know Kiana, you had mentioned um is fear kind of the 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 driving force for us and i would say it's very much so for me um, a few things that I wanted to do um, is to be able to see like the glaciers in Alaska. Um, and I'm afraid that I won't be able to see it because it's, you know, melting. Um, there's, there's just a lot of those driving forces that um, I would say fear is, and it's also not because I think the other part of it is we're, we're not a afraid to fail also. I think we've had a lot of uh, what some people would consider failing moments in terms of, um, you know, living on this boat and kind of figuring it out. And um, we, yeah, so I think, I think it is and it's not. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, you all brought up some amazing points just in the last few minutes here. Mm -hmm. um, to kind of stay on the theme, uh, it's kind of you just brought up, Hong, about not being afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. I think that that particular fear, right, is what, I, is, in my opinion, is what really holds folks back. Um, and also, like, the, the fear of losing it all. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, if they put all of their money or their time or their energy, they're not sure they're going to get back in return what they put in. You know, yeah. so they don't want to waste that time. Um, so how have you squared that in your mind, right? Like, because 
there is a potential that you get out there and you spend a year or two and you're like, this really isn't what we thought it was. And it's cool for like a weekend trip or <laughs> maybe a week at a time, <laughs> but maybe not a year at a time. So, you know, how are you squaring that? And what, what, what would you do if you did have to make that decision? Um, the way we're squaring it is, is that we're not. Um, and we've just decided not to, um, you know, we, you, you add up all the subscriptions to all the things that you love in your life and you figure out what those cost for a year. It's not all that much different than being on a sailing boat, um, and sailing. So, um, boats are almost always depreciating assets. Um, they very, very rarely make more money than you paid for them. And you almost certainly had to spend a lot of money to keep them in the shape that they are. Cause saltwater is trying to destroy everything all the time. And it's really right. good at it. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a few people who have turned their boats into money making schemes. I don't, or not schemes, uh, uh, lifestyles. I don't think we're going to be one of them. Um, it's, it's just not something you can plan for. It'd be neat if it happened, but, uh, we're not planning for it. So we were just decided that, okay, you know, if it's going to cost X dollars a year to do this, what is, what is the freedom of not having to work going where we want to go? If we only make it, you know, 80, 80 miles up water and we find some place we want to sit and anchor for a year is that worth it is it worth it to hang out and do what we want for a year for for however many dollars that costs and we decided yes it is mm -hmm. yeah i love that it's worth the risk mm -hmm. right yeah. so, you know rather than waiting given the family experiences you were noticing and the health issues happening and people not being able to enjoy that retirement which we know so many people can't even retire you know, because there's just not the funds there available to do so. So really making a purposeful effort to live life to the fullest now, mm -hmm. right? And not allow the fear of failure, like you said, to hold you back. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I mean, I think that's just so amazing and it's, it's inspiring. And given your story, Hong, of, you know, your family starting off on a rickety boat <laughs> and <laughs> how that's come full circle, but in a different way. Like you've changed that relationship with a boat. Right. Something right. that was a fear. Yeah. Now it can be something that's pleasurable and how yeah. much, yeah, the freedom, fear yeah. to freedom. Right. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fleeing, I, I guess fleeing to freedom, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you're fleeing one situation and now you're free to choose kind of what lifestyle you pursue. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, yeah, kind of your version of the American dream. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and to your, you know, to answer your question, um, Andrew, I, it it definitely comes easier to D'Artagnan than it does for me in terms of that reconciliation, right? Um, because I have been uh, raised with that mentality of what success looks like. And it's in that very traditional sense, um, having a home and, you know, having a wonderful family and the support structure and a very secure job. And um, I think, you know, for me, it is, um, although we've made the leap already in terms of selling our house, and, and moving on to the boat, um, it, it's it's a it's still a, a a struggle some days. You know, I think there there's a grieving process that I was not emotionally ready for, and D'Artagnan can attest to this. <laughs> the first few months we were on the boat, I probably cried every other day, maybe <laughs> not because I'm living my life on the boat because I, I didn't realize I needed to grieve the life that I had. Um, and that life that I had was very secured in, in my sense and in the sense that I knew of, you know, growing up and what my parents have told me all my life. Mm -hmm. And it's only become more so now that I'm realizing I feel so liberated it's such a liberating feeling to um, to be able to make these make this decision on my own um, with my husband and and our kids because they were a big part of this decision making process too. Um, they don't live on the boats, um, and so I think you know being able to reconcile with those emotions is a real thing and it, it's a it's a it's a daily balance i would say so i do, i certainly don't want uh 
people to think that it does not exist. It's very easy. I would say it's something that is a very personal journey. Um, but as they say in, in the boating world, that the highs are very high and the lows are very low. So it, it is a daily balance, I would say. Yeah, I think so in the pursuit of our dreams, sometimes I think we take for granted the sacrifices that's required uh, to bring those dreams, you know, to pass. And, you know, we talk a lot about on our channel, how imagination, your desire, you know, that image that you have creates your reality. Yes, but then there's also unintended consequences that come along with it. Because oftentimes we only are looking at the end result. We mm -hmm. only see living on the boat or we only see the being a CEO or being a president or owning your own business or, you know, whatever the case is, we only see that, but we don't necessarily think about the in-between, you know? So as you all have gone through your journey, maybe share a little bit about some of those. And you've already kind of shared a few, but um, maybe a little bit more detailed about what were some unintended consequences. They don't all have to be negative, but some things you didn't think about ahead of time that were like, oh yeah, that's a reality that we have to deal with. I, you know, I would say the biggest thing for me is the dynamic shift our, of our nuclear family. Um, you know, not having them, you know, at a moment's notice, you know, or turning down the hall and, you know, not having our kids there. It's, it's a different shift. Fortunately for us, we spent, you know, the last couple of years with them before we moved every single day because of the pandemic. <laughs> and I think they were at a point where they were, they wanted some separation. <laughs> so the timing actually couldn't have been better. Um, but that, you know, that is, was an unintended consequence that I didn't fully consider or fully thought of. I knew it was going to happen, obviously, um, because they're not physically with us, but, um, but you don't think about that emotionally. Um, I think the, the time that D'Artagnan and I spend together now, I mean, it's basically have, have multiplied 10 times at least because we're in a much smaller space. Yeah. And if we didn't like each other, that would have been really challenging. Um, so walking the plank. Somebody's walking the plank. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and probably D'Artagnan. <laughs> <laughs> for, for the moment, she still needs me to sail the boat. That's um, true. So. <laughs> She's getting better all the time, but uh, right now if she wants to get back to the dock. She needs me. Um, Very true. Yeah. <laughs> nice. nice. Yeah. I think also our, our, some of our relationships with our friends have changed a little bit. I think more so uh, partially, of course, from the pandemic, but um, you know, we're in a smaller space, so it's not like we're entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we have to be more intentional when it comes to visiting our friends or, um, you know, continuing to forge those relationships. Um, but yeah, I would say that's, that's, those are some of the major unintended uh, consequences that I didn't necessarily think through. Mm. Anything to add, Titania? Um, I, I don't know that I have a lot of unintended consequences. Uh, only because this ready. sort of been well, this is this has been my plan in in the back of my head in some way, shape, or form for as long as I can remember. You know, since I was 15 and and on that dock staring at that boat and went, yeah, no, that's that's the boat I want. Um it came early and it came in a weird way, and I didn't expect that. And uh mm -hmm when it when it came to us um i you know I, when you when you want something you sort of knows about the internet looking at looking at things and so i'd been staring at these boats for a long time and on the for sale sites and everything else um and and it just so happened that that i got in contact with somebody who was selling a boat um but it, it wasn't within our means or our plan at the time to to get the boat um but we really hit it off uh the previous owners of this boat and i and us um and when it came for them to time to sell it, they said, we really want you to have it and, and, and made a bunch of insane concessions in order for that to happen. Um, so we ended up with the boat much earlier than we thought. Um, mm -hmm. 
and it was both good and bad. I think it gave us a lot more lead time to sort of prepare it for what we want to do. Um, our plans are to go up to Alaska, as she mentioned, um, and spend the summer up there at some point in time um, and see glaciers and all those kinds of good things. And then, uh, you know, sail south and see where we go from there. Um, we don't have any expectations, I don't think, of necessarily going around the world um, as in, in a complete circle, um, but we want to go around and for as long as we can afford it and as long as it's fun. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the, the plan has changed and, you know, there's always a little fear of, well, do we have enough in the coffers to make the trip worth it? Do we have enough in the coffers to be able to come back and have some semblance of a, of a life that we would still enjoy? Um, and that what that goal is changes, you know, there's a, there's a lot of societal pressure, I think on the, you know, the, the big house and the fancy cars and the white picket fence and the 2.7 kids and the pandemic dog and the whole nine yards. Um, and as we realize that that is not what we want, we don't want to keep getting things. We don't really care how big our house is. We actually appreciate a small space. Um, we appreciate the efficiency of, of the small things. Um, we, we, you know, decided like, okay, well, when we come back, do we need a three or a five bedroom house? No. Do we, is, does something like a yurt sound fun? Well, maybe, um, you know, do we want to try to build a little A-frame out in the middle of the stick somewhere and take all the solar panels off the boat and put them onto that? Um, so our, what we're looking for changes. Um, and that's, uh, I think what's keeping us here at the moment is just like, well, Right now, we both have jobs that we really enjoy um, and uh, are sort of at the, at, at least our peak of, of making En-ROADS in the financial gains. So uh, without trying to fall into the trap of, well, let's just keep doing this while the money is good, um, we just want to get to a spot where we can be out for, you know, 10 years, maybe, who knows, uh, and then still be able to land in a, in a way that we feel comfortable landing. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. There's so many, so many directions we can go. Up I know. Time. I was like, <laughs> 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 imagination created that boat in yeah. that scenario. We can touch on the fact that we have the finances. Yeah, and, there's you a know. lot of directions. But I did want to go. I did want to circle back first to the to the piece about you know when we were kind of doing our pre call. You mentioned that the boat that you are currently on is the exact style of boat. You know, maybe even brand of boat that. <laughs> that you saw in your image or that at you 15? at 15. Yes, it is the exact same boat made by the exact same manufacturer. It's not the exact same boat, but it's the same model, same year, same hull, same, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in essence, That's same true. boat basically. So right? at 30, I mean, yeah, 30 <laughs> years later, it's the, it's the it could actually have been the same boat. I don't know what boat that was. I didn't ever look at its name. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it is it is the same boat from 30 years ago. Wow. And so, so you know, awesome. right. Yeah. It, it was it, when, when the circumstances sort of all aligned themselves that, that the people we were talking to on the internet had one um, and that they really wanted us to have it because they liked us uh, and they chose to, to, to make a bunch of um, things possible for us to get the boat uh, sooner than we wanted it because we weren't ready to, to pull the trigger on a boat like this then. Um, she's a big girl. Um, so it's a lot of boat, um, but uh, it, it was just serendipitous that it happened that way. And there was just no denying that, that this was being laid in front of us and it was a choice to, our choice to refuse. Yeah. Well, serendipitous, but also a ton of research. You well, spent yeah, sure. a lot of evenings, D'Artagnan spent a lot of evenings looking at Yacht World. <laughs> And uh, I don't know, there's usually with this particular boat, only a handful on the market. And mm. at that time, uh, it was just a matter of the right timing and the right correspondence. And um, so, yeah, a little bit serendipitous, but also a little bit of action. <laughs> well, yeah, there's always action, right? There's always yeah. action. And, and, you know, we always we say sometimes, you know, you, you look, you find what you're looking for oftentimes, you know what I'm saying? And you are looking for something specific, mm -hmm. but 
you get maybe didn't exactly know how and when it was going to play out, but you know, it played out in the timeline it was maybe intended to, right? We'll say the universe or the stars aligned for you to get the boat at the time you did, you met the right people, you know, you, you had the, the concessions were made for you to acquire it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the, the, and you know, what's funny about this is when Hong and I have been talking over the last year, this part of the story never came up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't know that part of the story before. You're holding out, huh? You know, I just wanted yeah. to talk to them because I thought it was cool what they were doing and, you know what I'm saying, kind of the dream aspect of it and what they're doing is so aspirational mm -hmm. and kind of out of the box, right? Because they're, yeah. I mean, I know that there's a community online of boaters and, you know, there's YouTube, cha YouTube channels out there. So that lifestyle is more in the public sphere. Um, but people have been living like that for a long time, but you don't really hear about it. You know, no. like I said, I didn't really know many people that live on a boat um, outside of Amsterdam. Like, I don't know. You know <laughs> but um, so, yeah, so I think that part, the imaginal act creating a fact right? Mm -hmm. It's just kind of amazing. Now, again, yes, there took real work from the time he was 15 and the time he's an adult and the boat's now in the dock. Yeah. But it didn't, it doesn't mean that that imaginal act wasn't the original seed that was sown, yeah. you know, to cause his course of action from there forward. Mm -hmm. you know? And the real work was not, was not getting the boat in the dock. The real work was getting the wife in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. Unintended consequence, right? right. Oh no, Just very intentional home. consequence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, I think that's awesome. Mm. You know, just how things play out. And I think sometimes when people think about imagination creating your reality, they think it's real fluffy. They think it's, oh, I'm just gonna um, right. you know, and then all of a sudden it just happens, right? Yeah. Oh, it's outside, yeah. you know, and it's like, no, there, there are tangible steps, but it's things that feel natural, right? You know, you did what seemed like the best next step to be able to hold to that vision and have it play out, right? You know, yeah. so that's, that's a key piece with it too. Well, and you ask yourself, like in any, you know, in any decision, not, not every decision, not what am I having for breakfast, but you know, am I going to take this job or that job? Uh, you know, what gets me closer to my goal? Yeah. Um, and, and, and realize what those consequences are, you know, is this moving me farther away from what I want long-term to get what I need short-term uh, or, you know, is it worth making the sacrifice on maybe the, the great job in a landlocked city where I'd never get to be around boats that had more money, um, or do I take the you know less job that I can walk the docks every night and and stare at boats and remember that that's what I want? Yeah, um, yeah. And you know, Hong's dream has always been to travel. She just wants to travel, 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 travel. Uh, and she wasn't specific enough. You know, I so wasn't. You ended, up on a boat. you ended up being on a boat. I know. I was not. <laughs> I yeah. You have a strong desire to travel, right? And Sartani had the strong desire to travel on a boat, right? Exactly. So because yours was more general, you got what you wanted in a way as well, there right? It, it just oh, may not sure. have been the way that we thought. You got what yeah. you asked for. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, you know, I like to travel off the beaten path. I'm not into the touristy traveling. Um, so, you know, as D'Artagnan was planting seeds, um, you know, he was doing it through these experiences where I was just like, oh my gosh, we could do this for how many years? Um, so we were able to kind of, um, I was able to have those um, real life experiences that kept me wanting to continue to pursue this dream. Mm -hmm. Basically, I hid all the terrible, ugly boat life things from her for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> Until she was committed. Right. Yeah. 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 